Have you had a good week? Have I missed something? Did anyone mention the fact that there was a cup final yesterday afternoon? (laughs) I don't know what's going on in this church. (laughs) We haven't acknowledged a major sporting achievement, which I have to say I didn't watch, but was very annoyed to discover had gone into extra time. So the programme that I wanted to watch yesterday evening was delayed. Was it Man U that won? Yes? Any Man U supporters in here? No. That's why we didn't mention it. Fair enough. (laughs) So... um, As you've seen from the little trailer, and uh, as Tim has just mentioned, uh, we're starting a little three-part series today uh, on rest. I don't know if that's a word that appeals to you. Maybe we should just uh, actually kill the talk and lie down for (laughs) 25 minutes. Maybe if you want to do that, you can find a bit of space, and uh, I won't tick you off for that this morning. But uh, let's start off with a little question, given that uh, we've just seen that sort of earth man uh, yawning. Anybody here tired? (laughs) Yes, what a surprise. Not very many hands. Uh, not lots of hands. <laughs> I'm sure there are some people here this morning that got out of bed when the alarm went off. I don't know what time your alarm went off. And you leapt out of bed. You thought, wow, I'm so refreshed and energized. I actually don't need to put on the coffee this morning because that would just send me into energy overload. I'm sure there are a few of us that are here that are feeling like that this morning. But I'm quite sure that actually there are many of us that aren't. Because we seem to live in um, a world uh, that leaves us feeling a lot of the time exhausted or tired. I don't know if that's, uh, well, some of us are feeling like that this morning. You don't need me to tell you that we live in a culture where many of us uh, contend with, on an ongoing basis, a kind of sense of being sort of stressed or overwhelmed or overcommitted or overstretched in different ways, where people are weary and over busy. If I had a pound for every time I heard somebody say, you know, oh, I'm so busy, I actually wouldn't be living in Cheltenham, I would be living in Mauritius because I would be so well off. <laughs> I think it, you know, we seem to be at a particular point in time in 21st century culture where where many of us are living in a kind of overstretched way. And we kind of maybe feel more often than not stretched and stressed rather than rested and refreshed. I don't tend to hear people saying very often when I say, how are you? I'm feeling really rested or I'm feeling really refreshed. I don't know about you. Maybe if that's you, please come and tell me afterwards because it's always good to be encouraged. But I think we, we see, don't we, when we look at the news, we see um, the impact in our nation increasingly of uh, a nation of people who are living in stretched and stressed ways. We see the impact, don't we, increasingly on family life, on our relationships, on uh, days taken off work sick in the workplace, on our health, on our sleeping, on our eating. We see the impact of this kind of overstretched life all over the place. And as followers of Jesus... When we're feeling or we're living in a kind of stretched or stressed way, we tend to end up not living life in the way that we would want to live it, not giving ourselves in the way that we want to give ourselves. We don't tend to end up living out our values and our beliefs in the way that we want to. We don't end up loving people in the way that we want to. We don't end up with the kind of quality of relationship with each other that we want to. Weariness ends up disconnecting us from God and from each other and from the stuff in our hearts. And it's not because we've stopped loving God or that because we've switched what we believe or we've kind of checked out of some of that kind of stuff. It's because the demands and the pressures of life tend to take a toll on our soul. I'm sure you don't need me to remind you of that. I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, you know, well, we've been going through a very challenging time here. I found myself apologizing to a friend, to a close friend earlier on this week for basically being a lousy friend over the last two or three months. I actually don't believe I haven't been the kind of parent I want to be. I haven't been the kind of friend that I want to be. I haven't been the kind of wife that I want to be. Because, you know, I'm I'm carrying a bit of a toll in my soul. I think that happens to us so often in so many dimensions of life because of what it is that we're, we're contending with. Soul weariness. 
or soul stress, as I like to call it, is as the result of exceptional circumstances that come along and hit us for six at certain times in life. That's one thing. But living in an ongoing way, on an ongoing basis, with that sense of, of weariness in our souls or stretchness in our souls, that's another thing. When the relentless onslaught of all the kind of stuff that needs doing, all the deadlines that keep bombarding us, the strain of the decisions that need taking, a difficult home environment, challenging financial pressures, challenging decisions and responsibilities. When we live with that kind of stuff on an ongoing basis, it has the potential to end up taking a toll on our souls, impacting us spiritually and emotionally to our detriment. One of my favourite verses that you'll have heard me quote if, you, if you've been here, uh, you know, if you come here often, is Proverbs 4.23, the wisdom of Solomon. He says this, guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. That's the wisdom of Solomon reminding us that the condition of our souls really matters. The shape that our souls are in, the health of our hearts determines our destiny. That's what Solomon is saying. So today, we're, we're kicking off this series, this three-week series on rest, and I'm going to talk about rest for our souls. Rest for our souls. For those of us that have a kind of sense of, a constant sense of not having enough hours in the day, too much to do, too much to juggle, a sense of wishing life would just slow down because we're a bit behind and there isn't enough time. For those of us who have a sense of inner restlessness, as it were, or a heaviness in our hearts. For those of us who are um, conscious somehow that we're less able, like I described before, to love or engage or give in the way that we want to give. For those of us that kind of feel in our relationship with God that we're just not moving forwards, there's a sense of stagnation or staleness or disconnection in our relationship with him. For those of us that identify with any of those kind of scenarios, there's good news. There's always good news. Because Jesus knows about your soul. Jesus knows about my soul. He knows about the pressures and demands and challenges of your life. He knows about the pressures and demands and challenges and what impact they can have on our souls. He knows about people who feel rushed and tired and pressurized and stretched and anxious and distracted and frustrated and afraid and superficial and disconnected from God. He knows about your soul. He knows about my soul. He cares about your soul. That's the good news. He knows about your soul and he cares about your soul. And he cautions us to look out for our souls because he knows that the, the, the condition of our souls shape the rest of our lives. So he issues an invitation. It will be a very familiar one to most of us. And he says this, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will will give you rest. Don't you love that word? He doesn't say, I will give you help to try harder. I'll give you solutions so that you can fi fix more things and fix more, fit more into your day. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart. And he says it again. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't that the most brilliant invitation? It's an invitation from Jesus to each one of us this morning. A couple of things to pick out from this particular invitation before we move on to another passage of scripture, which I think are really good to, to remind ourselves of again this morning. Firstly, God's heart is for rest. God's heart 
is for rest. Jesus is offering rest. And although we tend to think of this, I think, more often than not as a physical word, you know, if I say to you, picture rest, you know, many of us probably picture ourselves at home on the sofa, you know, with a glass of wine or a cup of tea, you know, watching the TV or picture ourselves on a sun lounger on a beach, soaking up the rays, you know, in Mauritius, (laughs) I wish, or, um, I don't know, getting into bed uh, for a an attempt at a good night's sleep. Many of us picture rest as being a physical thing. But rest is actually also a spiritual thing. The rest that God offers is so much more than a physical thing. And Jesus spells it out and says, I'll give you rest for your souls. Rest is a soul word. Let's get that. Rest is a soul word. It's a physical word, but it's also a soul word. It's the kind of rest for our hearts and minds that means that we don't need to worry, that we can stop fretting, that we can stop being afraid, that we can stop striving to make everything work just so, that we can stop trying to have life sort of perfectly ordered uh, and so that it goes well. So that we don't have to prove ourselves, that we can stop feeling guilty. The kind of rest that Jesus is talking about is a rest for our souls. What does it look like? A few years ago, um, we had the fortune, the good fortune to be in uh, Southeast Asia as a family. And uh, we'd been staying on um, an island uh, for a couple of days. And uh, of course, if you're staying on an island, the only way back is across the sea back to the mainland. And it came to the end of our little two-day trip to this island. And uh, we were a bunch of people uh, being uh, loaded up into the boats to go back to the mainland. And uh, we're a family of six. And of course, they wanted to put the family of six in one boat together. And uh, there were a few boats sort of being loaded up with people uh, on the shore of this island. Uh, island and um, we grews got kind of left to the back of the pile. And there were some really cool, big speedboats uh, which we'd come over from the mainland on uh, a couple of days previously. We were kind of looking at them slightly enviously, thinking, that's the boat we want to be in. Uh, But those boats got loaded up. We got left with the bottom of the pile, this sort of little... It wasn't really a fishing boat, but it was this small boat with open sides that just looked really tiny in comparison to all of the other boats. So we put our luggage in, got in, and set off across the sea back to the mainland. And about sort of five or ten minutes into this 45-minute journey... Uh, the winds began to whip up and uh, the sea began to swell. And uh, we ended up having, I have to admit, the most terrifying journey I have ever had in any means of transport ever. This little boat was sort of, you know, being moved, I don't know what the technical sort of sea term for it is, tossed to and fro. I was clinging on for dear life. I actually had to close my eyes because I couldn't cope with the size of the waves. Our daughter, Becca, was terrified and had her head buried in Tim's lap. The boys thought it was quite cool. Uh, (laughs) It's classic stereotypes. And uh, by the time we got to the mainland, actually, one of the main boats had started to come out and look for us because, obviously, they were quite concerned as well. But I was absolutely exhausted. I was so tense from uh, this journey and the anxiety and the fear and the praying that had gone on. Jesus was on a boat, as you remember, in a storm once, a much bigger storm, I'm sure. And what did he do? He slept. He wasn't clinging onto the boat for dear life, praying his socks off. He was asleep. I think that's a beautiful picture of what a soul that is rested, a soul that is at peace, a soul that is resting in God looks like. Able to, as it were, be at rest despite what everything else is going going on around us. And that is his heart for us, that we would know that kind of rest for our souls. So God's heart is for rest. And secondly, easy, which is in this passage, let's just flag it up. Easy is a soul word. You know, John Altberg, quote from John Altberg, easy is a soul word. We, we, we face all kinds of struggles and challenges in life, don't we? And uh, Jesus doesn't promise us an easy life. He doesn't promise that life is going to get easier, as it were, circumstantially, when we do it with him. 
We were built to take on challenges. We were built to fight battles. We've been singing about being an army. We were built to, to walk in victory. We were built to love our enemies. We were built to move mountains. Easy is not a word describing life. Easy is a soul word. Jesus says if we come to him, it's not that life gets easier, but that we will have a sense of ease in our souls. That our souls will find a peace and a rest because we have his yoke upon us. I.e., if we're doing life with him, that's the position that we should expect to uh, journey from. Knowing joy and freedom and peace, no matter what is going on around us. So, holding this invitation, this come to me and I will give you rest. Holding this invitation in one hand, I want us to turn to uh, the book of Luke, if you've got a Bible, uh, chapter 10. I'm just going to read four verses from, chap uh, from uh, verse 38. Uh, a, a familiar little uh, cameo that will be familiar to many of you. One of my favorite little stories uh, in the New Testament. And uh, we're just going to uh, pick out a few little things from it about rest. So it's the story of Jesus coming to Mary and Martha's. Uh, they were close friends of his. He rocks up for an evening, wants to chill out and spend some time with them. And uh, this is what happens. While Jesus and his followers were traveling, he went into a town and a woman named Martha let Jesus stay at her house. <clears throat> Martha had a sister named Mary who was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him teach. But Martha was distracted with all the work to be done. She went in and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me alone to do all the work? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. Only one thing is important. Mary's chosen the better thing and it will never be taken away from her. So we've got these two sisters We've got them entertaining Jesus, close friends of his, excited to have him for supper, excited to have the king of kings in their presence. Uh, and it's, it's, of course, it's a story, as it were, of an outward picture, but it's also a story of two souls. Some people kind of come to this story and kind of think that it's a story about activity, which is bad, as in Martha, and, it's, and a, a story of passivity or uh, just sitting quietly with Jesus, as in Mary, and that that's the way to be. I think it's slightly more profound than that. I think this is a story, really, about a weary soul and what the weary soul did and should have done. Mary has got a depleted soul. We can picture the scene, can't we? She's in the kitchen. She's invited Jesus into her house. She wants to put on a feast and, have, and throw a good time for him. And uh, she's excited, probably, about what's happening and the privilege of hosting uh, this friend of hers at home. And she's in the kitchen, and, uh, you know, we don't need to think very long to imagine the pressure building. You know, whether she was cooking too many dishes, whether she was irritated by the laughter that was coming from the lounge, we don't know. And, but something happened in Martha's sort of uh, activity in the kitchen that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't know whether it was the potatoes boiling over. I don't know whether she realized that she hadn't bought cream from the dessert and the shops were closed. I don't know if she was trying to get a, jar, uh, a lid off the jar of mango chutney for the curry that she was making and suddenly she dropped the jar on the floor. We don't know. But we can imagine the moment and suddenly the straw has broken the camel's back and suddenly it's Jesus' fault and it's Mary's fault and into the lounge she storms. And she cries out with self-pity and resentment and irritability. We can hear it in her voice, can't we? Don't you care? I mean, what an ironic thing to be saying to Jesus. Don't you care? Jesus doesn't care. Mary's being thoughtless and selfish. That's the perspective that Martha has ended up with. Freeze frame that moment. We're looking at a depleted soul. This is the evidence here of a depleted soul. It's not that Martha needed help in the kitchen. She needed help in her heart. In my car, when we're running low on petrol, an orange light goes off on the dashboard. We can't see our souls. We can't see the condition of our hearts as it were and where they're weary and where they're stressed and where they're overwhelmed. We just have to look for the signs, as it were, on the dashboard that point to the fact that uh, we're running on empty. And resentment and irritability are two of those signs. 
When we become resentful, when we become more irritable than normal with the people we love, with the people at home, with our colleagues at work, maybe with people around us in church, whatever, they're signs that we've got depletion going on in our soul. And like Martha, it's easy to think that, oh, it's somebody else's job to fix it. Jesus' job to fix the problem that I'm facing or other people's job to come and help me. But if that's the perspective we hold on to, we miss the fact that our souls are in need of rest. I wonder if you know what your own warning lights are. Do you know what the warning lights are in your own life when your soul is running on empty? Are you somebody for whom it is resentment and irritability that starts bubbling up in a sort of extra uncharacteristic way? Are you somebody who becomes more judgmental or more, more critical when you're under pressure? Maybe you're somebody who tries to escape into overwork. Maybe you spend more hours at the office. Maybe you escape into overeating. Maybe you escape into overdrinking. Maybe you escape into oversurfing. Just spend hours and hours on the net. Do you know what your warning lights are? Maybe you become numb to the needs of those people around you. It's kind of like you know you should care, but you just don't feel it. And emotionally, you just don't really want to connect. Maybe you start feeling sorry for yourself and you start going around trying to cover sympathy and stir up sympathy. Maybe you're somebody who becomes a bit apathetic and starts feeling a bit disillusioned. Maybe you just disengage with God and you start finding it really, really hard to pray. Do you know what your own warning lights are when your soul is in need of rest? Do you know what they are? Can you recognize them? We know that Martha's issue here was a soul issue because of Jesus' response. Jesus could have said, right, come on, everybody. Let's get up. This will only take five minutes. Let's just whiz into the kitchen, get it all done, clear up the mess. I'll go down to the shop and get the cream. And then we can all sit down and have supper together and carry on with the kind of fun evening that I've got planned. He could have said that. The reason he didn't was because that wasn't the real issue. And Jesus always goes, doesn't he, for the real issue. He's talking to a woman who is worried and upset on the inside, which actually, speaking as a woman, can be quite dangerous for a man to do, can't it? <laughs> I found this little slide during the week. Just thought I'd show you that. Top seven things man do, men do that upset women. Lie, be honest, not talk, talk too much, not show emotions, be too emotional, and breathe. <laughs> So Jesus is taking a risk here by being honest with Martha, but he loves us so much, he will always be honest. And so here comes a gentle rebuke. And I think he's really saying something like this. Martha, you're worried and upset about all kinds of things, but actually that's code for the supper isn't the real issue. The supper's not the real issue here, Martha. You've got stress in your soul. I know, and I care. And more importantly, I'm here. I'm here and I want to help. I'm here for you. Why are you doing what you're doing when you feel like this? It's being with me. It's listening to me. It's learning from me that's going to help you remember how much I love you and how much I'm for you and how much I want to do for you. That's what's going to bring you peace and strength and comfort Mary's chosen to rest her soul. I'm not taking that away from her because it's the best thing she can do. And Jesus actually wants that for Martha too, but he's not going to force her to sit down and, uh, and come and, and, and soak her soul, as it were, with him. But what he doesn't do is answer her prayer, interestingly. She's prayed, hasn't she, for help in the kitchen. He doesn't answer her prayer because what he really knows is that her soul is in need of something that her prayer won't, uh, an answer to her prayer won't give. Now, God puts this story in the Bible for our benefit, obviously. So what is it that we can learn? You know, sometimes we look at the stories and we learn from, from what people do. At other times, we look at some of the stories in the Bible and we get to learn from people's mistakes. I think there's a really important question here that we can learn from. What was it that stopped Martha from coming to Jesus when her soul was in such need? 
Why didn't she come and sit at his feet when she was in such a pickle, like Mary did? I think there's one significant word in this passage, which is the one I want to pick out, and it's the word distraction. Verse 40, Martha was distracted. She got distracted by everything that there was to do. She let the concerns and the needs of the day take over. She got busy doing other things. Can you relate to that? Has that ever happened to you? No, just to me. <laughs> do you know what? I think this, this word distraction here is a really significant word for us, particularly in our current culture with everything that we have to contend for, because, uh, contend with, because distraction is the enemy of intimacy. Distraction is the enemy of intimacy with anyone, actually, but especially with God. Attention, isn't it? Attention is what we need to give each other for close relationships to flourish. Attention is a gift that we give other people. And attention is something that we give God, we need to give God, if we want our relationship to flourish. Not because he needs that gift for us, but it's when our attention is on him that we are able to receive from him and be blessed by him and to become the person that we want to be. It's when we give him our attention that our souls are fed and nourished. But the more we try and cram into a day, guess what? the more distracted we become. Distraction is a real challenge for us, I believe, in the 21st century. But if we're going to come to Jesus, if we're going to respond to this invitation to come so that we have a healthy soul, so that our souls are functioning from a place of rest, it requires us to recognize the danger of distraction and then to actually engage with defeating it. How good are you at dealing with the distractions in your day that prevent you from coming to Jesus? I know I've got a long way to go. Because it's busyness and distraction that will always invade our awareness of God's presence. And it's when we're connected to God's presence, when we are aware of his presence with us that rest begins to invade our soul, that peace begins to invade our soul, that confidence begins to invade our soul. In Exodus 33, God said, I will give, God said to Moses, I will set my presence with you and I will give you rest. There is rest in the presence of God. But distraction keeps us from coming to God unless we are very intentional about deal with, dealing with him. So I want to ask you about the word stop because resting is actually about stopping. How good are you at stopping in your every day and specifically stopping to be with Jesus? How good are you at stopping? I mean, some of you will be coming out in a rash with that word because you'll be sitting there thinking, Hills, you've got absolutely no idea what my daily agenda looks like, what my timetable looks like, what I have to get done. I've got little children. I've got demands at the office. I've got elderly parents. I've got so much to contend with. But actually, we've got to learn to stop and to contend to stop and to fight the distractions that prevent us from stopping in order to be able to come to Jesus to give him our attention so that our souls can actually find rest, which means being able to say no. It requires, actually stopping requires being able to say no. Saying no to an arrangement that actually we can't cram into our day. Saying no to extra hours at the office because it's going to sort of make the day too, uh, too overcommitted saying no to the needs of a child or an extra child activity because it's just going to tip the balance. We've, saying no is a key to being able to stop and find room for Jesus in our daily uh, walk. I was uh, talking, I spent some time with a young girl who I was mentoring uh, a couple of years ago. She was in uh, the second year of the sixth form. She was uh, wanting some help. 
uh, in her walk with Jesus, she wanted to sort of move on in the life that God had called her to. She sensed there was more for her. And uh, we talked about her daily routine. And she said she got up in the morning. And the first thing she did was to put on the tea and have uh, put on the TV and have uh, her breakfast with the TV. So we talked about the distraction of a TV and what would happen if she had her breakfast with Jesus and had her Bible open to read it rather than, uh, you know, having the TV on and being distracted by it. So she decided to contend for that bit of uh, time with him, uh, decided to say no to that distraction. And suddenly her walk with God and actually the things that God wanted to do through her life began to change radically, purely and simply because she contended to give Jesus her attention and come to him so that her soul could find rest in him. It's a challenge to stop. It's a challenge to wrestle with the distractions that contend for our time and attention. But unless we do, we can't listen to him. And what Jesus invites us to do in Matthew, 20, in Matthew 11, 28 is to come to him so we can learn from him. That's what Mary was doing. She was learning. She was listening. And we cannot listen to Jesus if he doesn't have our attention. We love to be listened to, don't we? We love it when people listen to us. We love it when they get us. We love it when they understand us. We're not quite so good at listening. But if we're not listening to him when we stop, we're just having a quick breath and a quick pause to pray the prayers that we need to pray before rushing on. His rest and his love And his presence and his peace cannot invade our hearts in the way that he intends for it to. Jesus said, learn from me. We cannot have a healthy and a rested soul if we're not learning from him. How do you do? How how do you get on when you sit with God to read your Bible or to pray? How do you do in terms of being silent or being still or being quiet in your soul so you can hear his word to you? I don't know about you, but I can find it incredibly challenging because I'm distracted by all the stuff that's going around in my head for the things that I've got to do, for the things that I you know, was doing yesterday, for the things that I'm concerned about, for the conversations I'm having in my head with people. You know, there's internal distractions as well as external ones, aren't there? But in order to listen, we've got to come to that place of silence and stillness so that actually when that rhema word, when that word that he wants to speak to us lands in our souls to release rest and peace, we can hear it. One thing I'm learning to do is, that, is when I sit down with him, with my cup of tea and my Bible, I try and sit still and quiet for five minutes without saying anything. I find that really challenging just to sit still. Five minutes can seem like an eternity. But Jesus says, doesn't he, be still and know that I am God. And there's something about learning to be still and silent that prepares our hearts to listen for his word. If somebody in coffee was to ask you in a a couple of minutes time, what is Jesus saying to you at the moment? What are you learning from him? What is he speaking into your heart at the moment? What's he trying to teach you? Would you know the answer to that question? Would you know the answer to that question? Because our souls find rest when we come to him and learn from him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus offers us rest because of what he's done on the cross. He's done everything that needs doing. He's done everything that needs doing to provide for us, to love us, to care for us, to protect us, to empower us, to enable us. He's done it all. We don't need to try and do anything to please him or earn his favor. We're merely invited to respond to an invitation to come and be with him. Come and sit with him. Come and listen to him. And if we're willing to contend with the distractions that prevent that from happening on a daily basis, our souls will grow in their capacity to to know his rest, to function from his place of rest, and to bring and minister ultimately that rest and peace and joy to others that he puts around us. So why don't we stand? We're going to pray. There's coffee in a minute. You can ask each other what God's saying to you.
but we've got a bit of time before we need to collect children. <clears throat> So let's just be still. Let's just in the quiet be still. You might want to close your eyes to shut out the distractions just of the moment.